You actually saw this slide in my last lecture on French Gothic cathedrals, but now we're zooming in, first on sculpture and then on stained glass and the decorative arts. So let's begin with the Western, or so-called Royal Portal of Chartres Cathedral. The Royal Portal is actually one of the last Romanesque bits of Chartres Cathedral incorporated into the High Gothic Church constructed after the devastating fire of 1194. The Royal Portal sculptures, especially the jam sculptures, those are the sculptures along the edges of the door, are widely considered to be among the greatest early Gothic works. But before we look at the sculpture in more detail, let's return to the White Garment of Churches video for an overview of French Gothic sculpture. And I've pre created a template here for you to take notes. So returning now to the Western or Royal Portal and these jam statues of old uh, Testament kings. As the video notes, these figures are fully attached to their pillars, but they are not a substitute for the pillars. Note the comparison with the Greek caryatid, which actually did serve as a column. Yet while these royal portal figures are clearly attached, or to use the art history term, engaged to their column, they still stand out from the pillars with greater independence and higher relief than we saw in Romanesque sculpture. We are beginning to move to our genuine 3D sculpture, which we will see uh, come to real flowering in the Renaissance, which is our next unit. The jam statue on the right from the Romanesque church at Mosaic uh, that we studied in the last chapter offers a useful comparison between Romanesque sculpture and this early Gothic sculpture. What differences do you see? Well, most notably, St. Peter is flatter. It's in much lower relief. Uh, he's also more contorted more troubled looking, less majestic and comforting. The Romanesque era was not as confident or really religiously jubilant in age as the Gothic. Let's zoom in on the faces of these two figures. Uh, the one on the left from Chartres, the Gothic, uh, early Gothic sculpture, and on the right again, Romanesque of St. Peter from Moisac. What, do you, what else do you notice about these two? Well, again, it's very clear here that the Chartres figure is much more three-dimensional. He's also, I would say, somewhat less stylized, a little less linear. His face is more serene, as I noted before, while the Romanesque St. Peter appears more troubled. Still, these are the earliest Chartres Jam statues, and they still show many Romanesque elements. And yes, this is actually not an accidental repeat of the comparison of these two statues. So what are some of the Romanesque elements that you see in the early Gothic uh, sculpture from the West or Royal Portal of Chartres Cathedral? Well, what seems most obvious to me is that the figures are still very frontal. Really, the Chartres figures are more rigid and frontal than the statue from Moisac. Both figures are elongated, and their clothing relies very heavily on line rather than the contours of the body. And by the way, the elongated uh, figures will continue to be a feature of Gothic sculpture, although it will become a little less extreme. While St. Peter is moving, his body still seems unnaturally contorted. Notice uh, in particular how strangely his left hand seems to be behaving. While the Old Testament kings and queens are, I would say, unnaturally still serene in some ways in the, in the ways of the Egyptian statue. Again, perhaps conveying eternity. So here's the tympanum over the central portal of the royal portal at Chartres. In other words, the central door probably would have been clearer to say. So what do you see? Well, we see Christ enthroned within a mandorla at the last judgment. So this is a very familiar theme from Romanesque art. Below him in the lintel, remember that's that beam right across the doorway underneath that rounded semicircle or lunette. Um, Beneath him in the lintel are the 12 apostles. The composition, 
the subject matter, the elongated, rigidly frontal figures all seem Romanesque, although maybe the figure of Christ is slightly less forbidding than similar statues at Moisac and Vézelay. The tympanum above the right door shows Mary as the throne of heaven, holding Christ on her knee, again a familiar image. Below this is the presentation in the temple, Jesus being presented in the temple as a youth, and below that are the Annunciation, the Visitation, the Nativity, and the Annunciation of the Shepherds, all very popular New Testament themes. Note again that Mary is a much more central figure in Gothic art uh, and part of the more approachable religion of the era. Even more important are signs of high medieval humanism in the lower right and left-hand corners, which I think you'll probably have a hard time picking out. Any guesses about what these figures represent? Well, in the lower right corner are Pythagoras and Donatus, who was a Greek teacher of rhetoric who tutored St. Jerome, the great translator of the Bible into Latin. The figure in the lower left-hand corner, intriguingly, is Aristotle, and we're going to look at that a little more closely here. So there's Aristotle on the lower left. The juxtaposition of Mary and Aristotle in the same sculpture really captures the spirit of Gothic humanism. Just to finish up this amazing royal portal, here is the tympanum above the left door. Christ is ascending to heaven accompanied by angels. Again, this could very easily be a Romanesque theme, Romanesque tympanum. Signs of the zodiac and the labors of the month, month march along the archivolt, uh, and ten of the apostles are present in the lintel. Moving from the west to the north and then to the south portals, we also move forward a century to a period after Chartres was rebuilt along Gothic lines. In northern Europe, it was common for the iconography of the north side of a church to focus on Old Testament themes with stories from the lives of the saints and gospels more prominent on the south side, which was physically and therefore spiritually brighter. So again, light, notice, has an artistic and a theological significance. So here, and again, this is from the Old Testament or North Portal, we see from left to right as we face the statues. I know left and right can be a little confusing under these circumstances. We see Melchizedek, Abraham with Isaac, Samuel, and King David. So what has and what hasn't changed as we move from the Western and earlier portal to the later North Portal? Well, the figures are still elongated. The bodies still rely very heavily on line. Uh, the drapery is very linear. We're not seeing a lot of body parts. Still, these Old Testament figures are more natural and more expressive. Oh, I should note also that the heads are dispropor disproportionately large for the bodies, another sort of Romanesque element. But these figures are no longer rigidly frontal, and their faces are less stylized and more individualistic. And now we move to the south portal. Oops, sorry, that should be the Gregory and the saints got cut off there on the right. Um, but here we see a real flowering of high Gothic sculpture. So what changes do you note? Well, I think it's almost like the story of Pinocchio. Someone has breathed life into these statues. They not only come very close to being freestanding 3D sculpture, uh, the figures actually give the impression that they're communicating with each other. We're going to see more of that as we move on. Uh, and here also on the south transept is a very famous sculpture, a Saint Theodore portrayed as a Christian knight. So notice we've lost the togas, we've lost the Greek drapery. Uh, Saint Theodore here is wearing the cloak and chainmail armor of the Gothic Crusader. So he's basically in contemporary dress by these standards. The handsome young face is idealized, again, kind of like Greek statues. Think of those statues of the young athletes. But I would argue that it's more individualistic than, for example, the face of the spear bearer. 
In this depiction of Christ, we see a statue that's almost free of its architectural setting. We're getting very close to standalone three-dimensional sculpture. Although note that the architectural canopy over his head, in fact, represents, as did the cathedral, uh, the most modern cutting-edge Gothic style. But here again, we see not the youthful good shepherd of early Christian art, not Christ Pantocrator or world ruler of Byzantine art, not the fierce and solemn judge presiding over the last judgment, but the gentle, benevolent, approachable Christ of the humanist middle uh, ages. And by the way, it's really important to pay attention to the way the depiction of Christ changes. And we're going to see still more changes as we move forward because the art of the Renaissance and the Baroque periods is still very much going to be religious art. We saw the first hints of conversation on the Chartres porch of confessors, but in this high Gothic rendering of the angel Gabriel announcing Jesus's birth to Mary, and Mary's visit to John the Baptist's mother, Elizabeth, what we call the Annunciation and the Visitation, uh, full-fledged gossip seems to have broken out among the figures. They are really communicating with each other. They are interacting. So what other changes do you notice? Well, what really struck me is that the drapery here is much less linear, much more natural, much more like Greek statuary. And are those real knees and hips we see poking through? The classical influence on this sculpture is so obvious and so strong that art historians assume that the sculptor had seen actual Greek statues, or at least Roman copies of actual Greek statues. Uh, the elegant curvature, it's actually often described as an S-curve, of this statue reflects the court style of Louis IX. This is more mannered, perhaps, than naturalistic. Uh, and by the way, St. Louis is the one with the spectacular stained glass uh, chapel. You remember the one where the glass makes up three quarters of the walls? But this is a Mary, this is Mary as queen, complete with the jeweled crown. It makes me think in some ways of the Bodhisattvas. Uh, this is a this is art for the court, and she is shown as someone who would fit into the court. Uh, notice too how young and approachable she appears. This is again part of the veneration of Mary that is so important to religion in this period. So here's one of those uh, helpful summary slides that I begged, borrowed, and stole. It's not quite clear to me why this building was included in the French Gothic section of the textbook or in this set of slides, which was labeled French Gothic before I started fiddling around with it. But it's worth noting that the Gothic style extended beyond churches. I wish I had more time to talk about medieval guilds. Maybe if you're lucky and are running ahead of time, Ms. Jacobs could do that. But let me just note that artists were no longer exclusively or even primarily monks, but instead they were for the most part skilled members of craft guilds that carefully controlled quality, production techniques, and prices, uh, also entry into the profession. So this ornate and expensive building signals just how powerful many of these guilds became. Uh, and here's the private home of a very wealthy Frenchman again, just note the Gothic influences. In this video clip, uh, again from the White Garment of Churches video, Art of the Western World, uh, we're going to get a quick review of Gothic architectural architectural innovations. I kept it in because it's sandwiched between really wonderful pictures of the stained glass at Chartres. And again, I just think a video captures this in a way that a photograph can't. Uh, but above all, you're going to take a look at Chartres' spectacular stained glass windows. Oh, I was very tempted to include a lot more stained glass window slides, and feel free to look up more on your own. Uh, but these are two of the most famous. On the left, we have Mary as the throne of heaven. Again, a familiar image. Note the frontal composition and the stiff figures. In many ways, stained glass art echoes Byzantine art, at least in this period. Think of mosaics. Uh, but I think it has a softer, gentler, gentler expression, or Mary does, that's really pure Gothic. 
Now the rose window on the right, donated by Queen Blanche, is held together by an elaborate stone armature that we actually see more clearly from this facade. You've seen several pictures of the facade of Chartres. Oh, I hate to leave stained glass behind, uh, but you're less likely to get a question about Gothic Ill illuminated manuscripts, not because there weren't many of them and not because they weren't beautifully rendered, but because there is so much other Gothic art uh, competing for the College Board examiner's attention that they're less likely. And if they're asking an illuminated manuscript question, it's actually more likely to be from the early medieval period uh, and particularly from the Hiberno-Saxon art. Nevertheless, uh, drawing and illumination was important in this period. Now, what's really interesting about this, this isn't an illuminated manuscript. It's really just a sketchbook by a master mason, but it shows that even though it's very unlikely that he had a highly advanced education, that he did know something about geometry and focused on geometric shapes uh, in his carvings and designs. Oops, sorry about that. Uh, this, this theme of mathematics, of humanism and science, and by the way, uh, when I was studying history in high school, uh, medieval science was usually dismissed. That is not the view of historians now. In fact, medieval science has undergone a significant rehabilitation. There were major breakthroughs in this period. It didn't all wait for the scientific revolution. And here you see God portrayed essentially as architect of the world, as the great mathematician. A theme, by the way, that we'll return to when we get to the 18th century enlightenment. The dedication page on the right uh, is interesting. I mean, obviously for its beauty and splendor, but also because it so clearly channels stained glass. You may recall that the Rayonant style was the truly over the top ultra decorative, maybe even busy late Gothic architectural style. This illuminated manuscript captures some of the same vibrancy and frankly, some of the same busyness in all of the design along the borders. Again, Abraham being visited by the three angels is a very common Old Testament theme because the three angels are seen as prefiguring the Trinity. Plus it's another annunciation scene and of course, Gabriel's Annunciation to Mary is a very popular theme, especially in this Mary-centered uh, Gothic period. And finally, given this era's great uh, greater wealth, it's no surprise that the luxury arts flourished. And there are so many things uh, that I could show you that your textbook could show you, but we're running out of time. But it's fun to note here that jousting was a very popular pastime, and it's captured in this exquisite intricate ivory carving. In my final Gothic art lecture, we're going to finally get out of France and see how Gothic art spread and in some ways morphed as it traveled to England, Germany, and Italy.